Well, we're here today with Bobby Allen for Open Wheel 101, and uh, Bobby, we really appreciate you being here. I'm glad to be here. I um, kind of like to talk about uh, your whole career. I went digging on uh, YouTube a little bit. I found the 1960 go kart world champion, world championship. I know you were only uh, two years old then. Is that right? Or <laughs> close to it? <laughs> what do you remember about? Uh, it was in the Nassau Bahamas. Is that where it was? Well, the, I guess the real story is uh, Jim Rathman, who lived in Miami, was a speedway car driver, and he he. Um, I had a shop across town, and I was 16, and and uh, I wasn't 16 then, but uh, I was earlier. I went to work for him because my dad was a race driver and drove for actually uh, he actually drove for Bill France, and we had a lot to do with help NASCAR in the beginning and that that kind of stuff. Your dad's name was Joe. Joe Allen, and yeah. he he was with Marshall Teague and, and Fireball Roberts used to hang on his car and et cetera, et cetera. Well, they knew Jim Rathman, and they bought these things called half midgets. That was when this thing first day was before even go-karts. Mm -hmm. So I ran them all the time, and Rathman bought go-karts. When Rathman bought the go-karts, I drove for him. And then I won the, uh, the first year I ran third, which was a class champion of the world champion. And because I ran third, and because they told me to take it easy in the race, don't wear it out, don't run it hard, try to save the motor last, because that was a philosophy. Well, then I ran the next two years and never did that. I ran it wide open and won the next two years in a row. And then through that, I got to go to um, Europe and drive for the, the Europeans. And then through the, with the Europeans, they wanted me to come back over there and run a class with them. And I said, no, I'm going to Indianapolis, because that, that was my big dream, you know, to do that. You're pretty sure you're headed that way. Yeah, well, I mean Jim Rathman won it in yeah, he won it sixty, in, was it? Or somewhere something there. like that in that neighborhood. He ran second three times and won it. And he was the, my mentor and talked to me a lot. And then I uh, I started racing and then and sprint car racing at the time was that way, but you had to be I think you had to be twenty one to run with him and I so I went to Pennsylvania at eighteen and I started racing there because that was the closest thing to it. So uh, but you did run around it in uh, like Hialeah? Uh, yeah, I, like ran, a, I ran there when I came back from there. I, when I went to Europe, I was 16, 17, and I came back and bought this guy that won races there, Bobby Brack, his stock car. They call them skiers or stock cars. And Bobby and Donnie Allison ran there, Red Farmer. And I ran with them a little bit, and they went to, they used to go north to Alabama. And some of the guys, Herbie and them guys, would go to uh, New Jersey. Pee Wee and them guys all go to New Jersey. So I, you know, naturally I wanted to race, so I wanted to. Uh, I bought a race car for them, and I went up to uh, I went up to uh, Peach Bowl in Georgia. Ran there on the asphalt there. Ran highly a medley, West Palm Beach a little bit. That thing was fast. And then we went to um, and then I loaded up one day, and I decided I'm going north to go race to be a race car driver. Well, my car was an asphalt car, not a dirt car. But I went to Pennsylvania because when you read Speed Sport, they ran three, four times a week. They ran that was a better racing. Paid 500 bucks to win, so I went there and uh, realized my car wasn't made for dirt, and I took a car and built it, come back home and build it, and, and then I'd go back to Pennsylvania and I'd run near them. I did go to USAC one time uh, a little bit, but they only ran once a week. It rained out all the time, and I'd saved a little bit of money. There wasn't enough money to keep going, so I, I went back and started running at home. Was it, was it Rassman shop where you learned to build stuff or, or weld and stuff like that? Or did you, I know your dad, didn't he retire when he a uh, pilot? and. Uh, well, he no, he he, uh, he was an airline pilot. He lived. In, they moved to Miami. That's where I'm from, mm -hmm. Miami, Florida. He was a pilot, and he still flew. Uh, he had to at that time. He still raced too a little bit. He had to quit racing to be a pilot. That was a rule. You couldn't race and be a pilot. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, then he uh, got these half midgets for me, and and ran for Rathbun. And uh, let's see. Then I ran to go karts and. Then the next thing I did was I start. I wanted to go to Indianapolis. So I was going to junior college, and then I quit that and moved north to go learn about racing. But where'd you learn to start build cars? Oh, that's I mean, right. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's right. What you asked me. In Miami, Florida, there was a guy Bill Hampke that worked for Wilkie, and he knew how to build like uh, any cars back then when they were made out of tubing. And so at his shop, in my dad's shop. I learned to weld there, well, a little bit learned to weld. I, I learned how to fabricate, cut the cars, because I'd make, help make their pieces. When I first came north to race, this guy Charlie Hill had a shop, and I wanted to build a race car. And I knew how to make the pieces, but they always welded them for me. 
and I, I knew how to braise a little bit too, but, but uh, this guy would never get it done. So I, I, I knew braising and I knew um, how to uh, stick weld through just going to places and working there. But then I went to uh, this guy's place and I, through braising, I knew how to TIG weld because it was almost the same thing. And I, I, I welded my own car up because he'd never get it done. And then that was actually the first car I started winning a lot of races with, which was a sprint car. Where'd you win your first race up north? Do you remember that at all? Um, it was a car from Charlie Hill. It was kind of, it wasn't a sprint car. It was like a modified type car because they had 30 by 90s in. Mm -hmm. And I won my first race. I can't remember if it was uh, Lincoln or Dorsey Speedway. I know I won the point championship at both places, but I don't know. I only won maybe a couple races, and that's why I hated points too. Because I don't think I won a race at Lincoln, but I won the point championship. I just didn't think it was right for you to win the point championship because you finished every race third or something. I didn't like that. A lot of people still feel that way, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't like points. I mean, the only points is great is this world of outlaws. It pays pretty good money. Um, anyway, I learned how to weld there so I can get my car done, and then I taught a lot of guys how to weld. Now I can't even weld them more because I ain't done it in a while. <laughs> um, there were a lot of, obviously there's a lot of innovations back then. Um, what sort of ways were you pushing the envelope at that time as far as, as far as uh, well, getting I always, faster? I always knew. Was it weight or what yeah, was it? Because I, I was a go-kart championship driver. I won, you know, they don't won all the races I ran with that stuff. And I, uh, I knew that weight was a factor in my mind. As long as the part didn't break, you make it as light as you can. And as long as it does its job right, that was my theory, then then I would uh, build the part light. And I just, back then we raced around crate motors out of the Chevrolet, you'd go buy a crate short block and put it in the car and you'd win. And other guys were buying motors, but I would, I would beat these guys, so I knew weight was part of it. Um, today it still is, but not quite as much, uh, I don't believe. I mean, it's part of it, but not all of it. It ain't it's made as, as, as big a deal. And, but I was, I, I had a good mind on myself because I built stuff in the shop and I'm always thinking of how to, how to make it better. So I'd always come up with little ways to make what I thought was better the car and I had a good feeling for stuff. And I was and Carl Kinder were both were kind of innovators on a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when did, I knew there were times were tough for you too. And I, I remember talking to you years ago one time and you, you said times were tough at that point in time when you moved north too financially and just trying to make a go of it. Well, when I was a kid and I was a world's go-kart champion, I won like 4700 bucks in a couple months back in 1961, too. That's like a lot of money. That'd be a lot now, yeah. Well, I used to go to, I was in high school and I had dress clothes. I was best dressed in school and everything, go down there and buy all that. And I was just a driver for the Italians when I went to Europe. Well, as soon as I bought a race car, I've been broke ever since, ever since. <laughs> every dime went to the race car, every way I had figured. Actually, right today, Run these two boys, it's really, I mean, I get a lot, of, a lot of, I have what I call the good old boy sponsors. I have a lot of, I don't even know how many, I'd have to count them up, maybe 15 what I call big little sponsors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm actually taking in way more money now than when I raced. Before, it was, it was more of a struggle in my mind. Uh, I've always done it on a shoestring. It's always came out. There's, I've got buddies that claim, well, one special buddy, Lupo, he said, he don't care what building I fall off of, somebody's going to throw a mattress down just in time before I hit the ground. <laughs> and it does seem that way. I mean, I mean, you all know that we took off this year, and I knew my truck was getting uh, a lot of miles on it, 650,000. They're, they're throwaway motors. I said, well, maybe I bought a truck from Hoosier that I'm paying on to get done to fix it up to, to try to make another tow rig. Well, that truck blew up on the way to Florida. And I knew, I said, i got to run it one more year, but I knew it was on the edge of blowing up or, or over time. It blew up, and somehow this Ryan Smith's dad, he's the only one he gave me a toter home to use because we need to, our, half our deal is everybody staying in the toter home half the time, um, going up and down the road, uh, you know, we don't stop at way station, don't have to do all that fuel stuff. It just seemed like I got all the little corners cut. Well, I'm ready to give it back to him. And two, uh, uh, the next week we was going to New Egypt, and driving to Florida, driving to Charlotte where the truck was because they got it done, tow it back home, drive it, uh, have somebody drive it back and pick up the new truck. And when I did, that thing blew up going to New Egypt. And uh, so the guys down there drove up to pick me up to bring me down there. And then I had the other one towed somewhere to be fixed now to give it back. I mean, but every way, somehow, some way, it, we, it works out. Yep. 
And you were saying that's kept you a little bit, not to jump to this year, but that's kept you behind a little bit this year with motors and things like that well, because we, your finance has gone we, towards we the start, We started out with two and a half motors and letting them run a little bit of laps and pull out to save the motors and make it through the first year. I mean, we look back now, we don't know how we made it through any year. And then we gradually, because my deal's motors, building them and, and, uh, and then Don Ott helped us out a lot of motors uh, doing the work for nothing. And then he started having to charge because now, today, to run like we're running now, he'd have to have his guys work two straight months just for me because we got to rebuild motors because we're trying to run every race and run, and run well with it. And I'm pretty sharp about motors, always was. And then I know every motor guy, so you can ask every motor guy one question, he'll answer you. And then so my nephew wanted to build motors starting three years ago and careful what you ask for. He has to work eight in the morning to four at night all winter just for me. They run a t Dad's got a towing thing, but he does it and he's doing a great job. And we actually feel like the, our motors, the, when we, the good ones we have, Nobody has anything over us. We know that because we can tell what we have them. We had two of them, and one of them I blew up at El Door because I put the wrong gear in it by mistake. By my rules, you always check the gears. I didn't check it, and it turned the motor too hard and blew it up. And then we run them longer. It's the only thing we do. We run them longer. Most guys' motors run 12, 8 to 12 races, and they take them out and rebuild them. Or they run motors uh, 15 races, some of them do, depending on the motor. Well, ours were in the 17 to 19 range, and we broke, were breaking pistons then. And so Logan, right after Charlotte, the next race, it broke a piston. And those are our two heavy hitters. They, and we plan by the end of the year to have four to six of them. We're, we're working on that now, trying to sell and do things. But by the total home being blowed up, they did a GoFundMe for me to help me. And it did raise 10500 10, The bill on the truck was $26,000. Uh, and, uh, and we were able to save the money with Logan doing good and the little bit we do here and there to save that to pay the rest of the bill off. But that was usually gone towards rebuilding the motors and getting ready to race this part of the year because we we're growing every year. And so that cut us short. So now we're, the motors are a little bit on what I call the definitely we knew we weren't going to be good here because the motors don't have the power. They're probably down 50, 60 horsepower. And they're just what I call sewing machine motors. Uh, after about, we figure, come on the phone every day with my nephew, we figure in another two weeks we'll have two motors and another three to four weeks we'll have a, uh, we did have a guy, he, he wanted to be anonymous, and gave us money to build another motor, and it's his motor. And uh, I w we should have that done within about four weeks and, and time for the big shows. And then the motors we got, we can rebuild them and go on with our business. But we're, we're not unhappy about it. We don't call, um, I don't call anything bad luck. I thought some of the circumstances, we're actually lucky to do what we do. We're lucky this guy loaned us a toter home or we'd be done. We'd be done all the way. We, we, uh, you can't afford to run at home. The outlaws do pay the best, have the best little things going that you can make ends meet if you cut every corner there is. Well, I, I use 80% of everybody's used tires, and there ain't nothing wrong with them used tires. They're good. They run them heat races, and, and they're, they're good. I mean, would you want new tires? Yeah, but, uh, and we do buy them because this is a time of year when they burn them up and you can't get it. We got two or three. Canes are the ones that mostly we get, and Pittman's are the best ones. Sweet runs a little harder. Pittman's tires are nicer, and uh, you got to pick the right ones. But anyway, through that, buying all them, we're able to do this. My drivers drive for less money. They didn't get any money before until they ran 15th and then 10% and then 20% and then if they won, 40. And, and, and so I figured that was a fair play. And now that we had a guy help us with a motor, we're gaining more. Now I pay him 20% to start. And if, if we, once we get to a certain plateau, I'll raise it more because I know they need to live and, and do things too. And I want it to be worth it for them too. Yeah, and I, I could probably speak for everybody how far uh, Jacob and Logan have come in the, in the last couple of years. I've seen Logan win two or three times in, in person in the last couple of years. Well, Logan definitely is a more aggressive, and he's got really two or three years more from the very beginning than Jacob's got. Jacob's more like I was, a little bit meek, but also, and it's not fair to say, is that, like I have another motor coming that was supposed to be for Jacob, but right now it'll go to Logan because Logan's more the breadwinner. And then now another week we might have the next motor and then Jake will get that motor and then Logan will get that motor. And there are two, I have three sets of motors that I call, um, I got the motor we feel is our best motor and I have two of those but both of them are down now. And then the next set of motors is one kind of like what Sweet runs, I think. I don't know what they do 100% but I know roughly what they have. And then the other set are Davy Brown motors. They're a little bit different motor but they're definitely good motors. Certain racetracks are good. Davy's, Davey's kind of got the race car savvy and, 
and uh, he knows he knows what wins races, and he does win races. How about that guy? Davy Brown's definitely incredible. He needs more. He gets recognition, but he's more than he thinks. He is. He's another Carl Kinzer. He just never got to go on the road. He's 80, 83 years old. He knows how to make that car win. And they do it off. They ain't no big budget thing. He's, he's won a race like every year since 53 or 54 yeah, or something. Anybody that ever drove for Davy Brown wins races. Davy Brown has a good insight. He can see things right. It really bugs me when they say they're cheating or whatever. They don't cheat. Did you ever work with him? Through the year? I asked him to work for me one time. He said, you don't need me. You go good on your own. No, he, I, I mean, I respect him. I wish he would have because you always want to know what they know. Weikert kind of had him quartered a lot of those years. Yeah, well, anybody that won it did, yeah, they did because he's definitely good. He's real good. Yeah. So uh, getting back to Central PA, you were uh, – did winning these championships, did that get you get you some better rides and things like that or people never, helping you I, out? Or? I never drove for anybody. I always drove for myself. Yeah. I drove As far as sponsors, though, or – as, now, would you ask me if sponsors as far as in Pennsylvania? Partners, people. Well, when I raced. When you first start now. And I, when, well, when I first run around, I did drive for Emory Chevrolet. Yeah, sure. And then the, uh, and then the uh, coal company, I drove for them. But besides that, basically, it was on my own. It wasn't really till Mark Pell, I was running down there at Jacksonville, and he, he came up to me and he said, Bobby, I want to help you and give you $1,000 tomorrow. Well, if you've been racing like I have, especially when they're drunk, I've been drinking. <laughs> You need to bring a book with you with, a, with that blue paper they used to have and have a contract sit right there when they're drinking because you get a lot more money. <laughs> and But he was the only one that showed up the next day at Jacksonville and brought me a thousand bucks. And he's been with me ever since. And Chubby, he's also been with me ever since. CMB Mushroom Club. CMB Mushrooms. It seems like any sponsor I ever had is still, they're always with me in little some form or other. Cause I try to be real honest with them. Um, and tell them how it is. If they get things get tight with them, I said, "Don't, don't help me. Just take care of yourself and me." And they're and they're good. I just got what I call the good old boy sponsors. This boy Marty Thompson, he's always been with me. Um, uh, but, but no. And then actually, when I started running the boys, I didn't wasn't even around racing much for about 15 years after I stopped. And I didn't quit racing. I um, had the go kart track going, trying to make money there. So I'd open up beginning of the year. And they had the race starting, and I had joined and put the car together to go race it. I sold everything to build this little indoor track that I had and only had one race car left. Well, I told him not to run it unless everything was fired up and running. Well, he went down there, and he took off in the heat wave, crashed, and flipped, tore the car up, so it was destroyed. Well, the only way I can get my money back, you got to be racing to win the money back to do it. Sure. So anyway, about three years went by, and the go-kart track didn't make no money. I said, you know what, I think I'm done. So that was, that was about it for my racing right there. That was I don't know what year that was, 97 or something. Right, somewhere in there. Uh, talk about uh, getting to with Shorty Emmerich, and, and you were teammates with Paxton, Lynn Paxton. Right. And he was he was, uh, he was was giving everybody headaches here a week or so week or so ago about uh, everything like he's he's good at. Talk about that a little bit. That was a good team, and I know you won a lot of races. Uh, for Yeah, I actually controlled that team. Emmerich had Paxton run for him, then he wanted another driver, so he had me come in there, and I built the cars, and Paxton – we drove for Emmerich, but Paxson drove for me. Basically, what we did, and uh, and I became Paxson with him and I. We we were great friends. We do agitate each other and got millions of stories. His are different than mine. Mine are different than his, but <laughs> they're both mine's the truth. His are his are not. His are a little bit far fetched. But no, Paxson. He was definitely good. And he, you know, I told him he got too old and retired. We're the same exact age within a month. Yeah. I think he said he retired at 39 or something like that. He was yeah, pretty he got old. old. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. How about uh, w what are a couple of your favorite stories there? I know he's told With something Paxton? about getting being stopped on the turnpike and uh, different stuff over the years. Well, we had a couple of them. One of them was um, he never went on the road. I made him go to race. He never went anywhere. Yeah. But anyway, He didn't leave the port. No, he, didn't, he was there. He's one of them kind of guys that stayed at home there. Uh, it'd be rain, pouring down rain. He said, why are we going? It's raining. I said, I'll bet you whatever it was, 10 bucks on the other side of the tunnel, it ain't raining. Yeah. Well, you go through the tunnel, it was raining. And he says, well, you, I, you owe me, I said, no, I didn't. I said, on the other side of the tunnel, we got a lot more hours <laughs> to drive. And then the other one, I think he probably told that story. We had this one guy, Troy, guy that actually built our motors uh, that I talked to that didn't really couldn't build motors. But we're going down the road because the shoes were old, sneakers, and we threw them out the window, Pax and I. And we said, when we get there, we'll go to the store and buy a pair of shoes. And... And so I got bit on this one, and so in the car, I says, I don't know, I said, I'll buy the left one, Pax, and you buy the right one. So when we get to the store, Pax said to the guy, he says, uh, 
we got by the shoes. How much is the right shoe and how much is the left shoe? And the guy said, the right shoe's free and the left one cost 40 bucks or whatever it was. So <laughs> Pax had made out on that deal. I mean, but the, we, oh, I know I did one to Pax or two. Let's see, it was um, Finley, Ohio. And it had a bank, no fence. And he, you know, running for me. And uh, I'd always send him to go pick up the money. Well, he ran off the racetrack, lost four or five spots, came back up on, ran second, anywhere somewhere. After race, I said, Pax, and you know they penalized you. You're lapped down for running off the racetrack. Well, he's, he, he likes to argue and yell and scream. So he cut out over the hill, went right up there and found out that he did run second, but he was mad. But they did, Osborne did that to him too one time. Pax liked old cars. So pa he, out in Indiana, he picked out a field. I think Pax was going out that way anyway. But he picked out a field, a blank address, or it was an address in this field, was a blank place. He told him where there was a couple of these cars he'd been looking for. So he searched all over for this thing, went there, well, it wasn't nothing but a blank field. <laughs> but if you know Paxton really well, that you got to do that stuff. You have to do it to him to stay keep even with him. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, like you said, you traveled around. Back then, you'd look at Speed Sport, you'd see what races were paying what where, and that is that how you chose it? You went out to Ohio and that's how I did. I mean, they they first started running races out in Ohio or anywhere they ran races. I would say, well, I'm going there. I remember at one time, uh, well, first when I first met Sammy, I went down there to. Um, um, Oh, uh, what's it? Memphis? Not Memphis. It's uh, what's the track across the river there? The ditch there. Yeah. Uh, well, we just ran it with the Outlaw Show. Or West the, Memphis. West Memphis, and they had this race paying, I don't know, three thousand win or something. So I called the guy up and I says, "When's this race?" Well, I'm I'm coming here. Can I get? I was asked. I get a little gas money, and I said, "What what's it pay to win?" And he said, three thousand, whatever it is." I said, "All right, I'll be there." Well, when I got there, the guy said he never seen anybody like that. They always wanted to know what it paid back. Well, back then. I thought I could win any race that I ran, and actually I would have. Sammy won it, but I would have. The, the first night I was leading it and blew the head gas between the cylinders, and Sammy did win it. And then the next night, I won the first lap. Sammy, let's see, I might have started on the outside, and that's the first time I ever ran that greasy dirt. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania's dirt's different. And Sammy dove to, he went, dove to the top right away because that's where he ran. I dove to the bottom and missed it, spun out and hit the whole pack head on. I went to the back, of, that's the first time Carl Kinder ever met me. I went to the back and came straight up and, uh, and uh, spun out again because it had a shock torsion bar off it. Uh, we did all kind of stuff back then, millions and millions of stories. Yeah, <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Uh, what, what about Steve Smith? You were friends in Florida with Steve Smith. And it's, did he end up following you? Yeah, up or I, uh, I raced in Florida uh, what I call the stock cars. Uh, that I ran there, that was where Red Farmer, Bobby, and Donnie knew all them guys, and I knew them guys there, and they'd go to the races with me, and then I went north and raced, and he, he wanted to race too, but he never raced before, so I brought him up there to help me. I brought Lupa up there to help me at different times, and then they just stayed there, and then uh, when I built this new car and I started winning races in Pennsylvania, then I built Stevie one, Steve one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and then... Uh you befriended Dub May, I think it was, in Van. Them guys, everybody knew Opperman, Dubby. Well, they always said anytime when they came there, if you want, I had a big shop, go to Bobby Allen's place. He'll let you be there. And I wanted everybody to feel the way I felt, so I'd tell them everything. It was stupid, but I'd tell them everything. And later on, I realized that I said that wasn't very smart, but I'd show them how to win, what it took to win, whatever. Yep. And stuff you were doing with the chassis too that was different. Yeah, my car seemed to win, and so I, you know, I'd build other guys' cars, and then. But I found out at first they would win and run good with them, but after about a month or two, then they'd quit winning too, most of them. Yeah. Opperman didn't. He was good. Sure, sure. The Travis cars were big back then, too. Travis was big, and they won. You know, they always had the good drivers, and and uh, they did win. And I built my, I was big more on weight. Travis wasn't more on a lot of weight. And mm -hmm. uh, the, a lot of stuff just happened by luck. Yeah. And, and you're fast, and they think, well, this is why. You won your first. Grove Open, was it 69 or so, or somewhere in there? Uh, well, that was, like, because I always had stuff. I, yeah, I won the Grove Open, whatever it was, and I, I led that thing How many thing laps was it at that point? 150. I led that yeah. thing probably. I should have won that thing eight times or something. But the rear end, one time the rear end went out. One time it had cracked heads on it. I didn't have buy heads. I said, I'll just run it and lead it till I did. I led it for 50 laps till I got hot and I pulled out. Yeah. But, I mean, that was that way. That's how it was then. I always did. I, for some reason, I just cared about being fast, and then, um, you know, I wasn't I, I wasn't driven for money. I was driven just for races. Yeah, well, and you had a lot of track records at a lot of different tracks. Yeah, across well, the I always country. would set fast time. But that's because the cars were light, and I was smart about where to run on the racetrack. Yeah, 
Yep. Um, started traveling more with the All Stars. Came into being before the World right. Outlaws, it had a obviously. Thing called Moss. M- that Moss was kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. I always they used to have Wednesday races, and I used to go to all the races. I was always the one that would, if you ran a race, I'd go to it, and then I'd go back home, and then uh, then the guy. Uh, I forget his name, but it wasn't Bert Emick, it was another guy. He did what they call Moss, and they uh, had a thing to pay 10000 to win and the point championship, and you would you would go run these races, and I chased them, and that got me a little bit about points too because I chased all them races. I did win it, but then I wasn't going to chase points again because uh, it would rain out half the races or you could go to what somewhere else had ran and made that same money. So I was kind of like anti-points more just to win races. So... Uh, and then the outlaws were that way in the beginning also, and then, mm-hmm. and then uh, finally they got to where they paid point money that you, you, got, you need to run all the races, because that's the only, at the end of the year, if you're like me, the only money you're gonna have at the end of the year is the point money. You ain't gonna have no other money left over. It's gonna be the point money, you're gonna spend every dime it takes to run every race there is to try to do the best you can. Yep, absolutely. Um, when the outlaws started, it wasn't necessarily one schedule either. Any show that paid over 1,000, I think it was, would they'd call an outlaw 2000. show. 2,000, was it? Yeah, really, to me, how the outlaws started, it started, Ted Johnson came to us, a couple of us, W and I or whatever, and they had a race in Louisiana, and he, want, and he said that he wanted to get two or three guys or four guys and five guys together and go run these different racetracks and get a little bit of money and go run them. And we went down to Louisiana, and then the thing died right off. Mm-hmm. Wasn't nothing about it. Well. Bob Trossel had wrote a thing in Speed Sport, and that was our Bible, Speed Sport, and it wrote about if they had anybody that they call, what they call King of the Outlaws, it should be Doug Wolfgang, because he won 40 races that year. Well, W and I were sitting in the office, we said, well, that ain't right. But just because you win 40 races on a racetrack that shows up with nine cars, or it rains out, they run time trial, and they call it a race, that's not right. It should be off money one. The guy that, like Ferkel or me, or anybody that went and traveled to, to here, or, or, or um, man's in need at the time to these big shows and went yeah. to other shows that paid thing the guy that won the most money that traveled all these shows that should be what we call king of the outlaws so we called ted johnson and i said ted we got an idea why don't we have somebody that wins the point championship or, or the number one driver that does what we were saying he said well how are you going to do that and i said well first of all there's only probably five guys that really race for a living like that most people have a job and he said, yeah, maybe we got something there. So they decided to, to do that, and we go to F- Florida and we, uh, from there. But then Ted had got with Lanny and Ferkel, and them, they talked, we have start, people were starting to talk about what they were talking about. And then they said, which was a smarter way to do it, they said any race that paid 2000 a win or more, that would be considered an outlaw race. It, wasn't, it didn't even have to be sanctioned or anything. Just the race, they, that would count as a point race, not an outlaw race. So, Could be on the same night in Pennsylvania, yeah, California? Or? Yeah, because I actually flew back to run a car in Mercer because of that the first year. Well, then they got together and they decided, no, that they, they need to sanction them. And then what you had happen also, right, when he's talking about how they jumped all around, well, promoters back then would say, well, there's no way I could pay that 2000 No way. That's way out of line. But they'd go to a race at four or five hours of that, and it, because they knew we were coming, it was packed. Well, now everybody's wanting a piece of this. They wanted that 2000 win race. Well, then it was like now they knew they had a little bit of something. So now this guy's wanting to race, that guy's wanting to race. So, yeah, it was like a back and forth or this or whatever, whatever it took. And they were giving us a couple hundred bucks to, to show up. That was part of the deal. And Ted was getting a little money. And then, it, and, you know, naturally after that, it started evolving from different ideas from different people. And it's, it really grew to, to, to be something. From micros to full-scale sprints, EMI has a complete line of chassis and components that fit any racer's needs. EMI provides a complete customer experience with personalized new chassis construction, complete suspension service, technical assistance, and repairs on any brand of chassis. More than 12,000 parts from the best brands are in stock and ready to ship. From a bare frame to a complete race-ready car, EMI can meet your needs. Call 855-525-1941 or visit us online at EagleMotorsports.com. 